100 years ago, traveling at 60 miles per hour seemed impossible. Now a car has smashed through the sound barrier at 763 miles per hour. Land speed racers risk their lives with every run. This is one of the most difficult and dangerous contests on Earth. Ever since the invention of automobiles, a select few racers have been obsessed with driving them to their limits. For the most daring, the land speed record has been the ultimate reward. The land speed record is actually one of the most fascinating and I think it's the most exciting thing you've done on God's Earth. I'm absolutely convinced of it. There are many different categories, but none has more glamour than the unlimited world land speed record. Once you fought through a land speed record effort and then been successful, um, everything by comparison becomes rather pale. Jet-powered cars are now unrivaled for speed, but this electric car represents the future. As soon as any new technology becomes available, there is always someone prepared to test its limits. Land speed records are nothing but adrenaline. Pat Rummerfield has triumphed over horrendous injuries to push the land speed record into the new millennium. The Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah have a long association with land speed racing. By the 1960s, the peaks surrounding Bonneville had begun to echo with the roar of exciting new technologies. This was a time of experimentation. The need for speed drove teams towards ever more extreme methods of propulsion. The power of the rocket proved phenomenal. But like a firework, once ignited, rockets cannot be turned off. It made them difficult to control, and they often caused serious damage to any machines they powered. Jet engines, by comparison, were easy to control. They could sustain high speeds and were much simpler to maintain. The new technologies were faster, but they could be lethal. In 1962, Glenn Leisher's car, Infinity, exploded mid-run, killing him instantly. He was not the first or the last to die. But nothing could deter the men who wanted to be the fastest on Earth. Hidden in a backyard workshop in California, an extraordinary machine was beginning to take shape. At only 25 years of age, its young designer had ambition and sponsorship to match. He'd grown up in awe of land speed legends like Malcolm Campbell and John Cobb, and was determined to get his own name in the record books. Craig Breedlove has been mad about cars since the age of 15. His need for speed was to change the land speed race forever. It's a car, believe it or not. In Los Angeles, Craig Breedlove unveils the spirit of America, his jet-powered three-wheel streamliner designed to go 500 miles an hour or more. Breedlove will attempt to better the late John Cobb's 15-year-old mark of 394 miles an hour and bring home to America the world land speed record. All America is with you, Craig. Good luck. 
When Breedlove arrived at Bonneville in 1963, it was the start of a revolution. My uh, take on the thing was to pull it a little bit away from the automotive arena and bring more of the, the aircraft technology into it. The FIA, Land Speed's ruling body, refused to certify Breedlove's creation. It looked like an aeroplane, only had three wheels, and most shocking of all, its engine did not power the wheels directly. It was a, a pretty scary thing for me. Uh, at, I was uh, you know, 25 years old at the time. I'd never driven a, a jet engine car. Of course, not many people had. Spirit of America was a jet engine on wheels. Steering the car was an unnerving experience. It was pretty terrifying because we had devised a steering system for the car that consisted of differential braking of the two back wheels and um, a steering rudder. And uh, the, actually, the, the system didn't work. <laughs> So later the same season, Breedlove returned to the salt with a modified spirit of America. The addition of a tail fin made the car more stable. To get a record, a racer must drive through a measured mile both ways inside an hour. On August 5th, 1963, Craig Breedlove made a two-way average of 407.447 miles per hour. But the really good news came from the FIA. To accommodate Breedlove's new technological approach, the official ruling body agreed to create a new record category, the Land Speed Unlimited. It set off a blaze of competition. Once we had set the record, it kind of drew a whole bunch of people into it. And that's really when Arfons got involved. I only knew of him through his drag racing. In his cluttered backyard workshop in Ohio, Art Arfons has been building and racing dragsters for years. For Arfons, the legalization of jet engines was a dream come true. Even today, Arfons is obsessed with engines of all types, jet, prop, or piston. His skill in matching the right engine to the right car is legendary. Power has always been uh, the instigator of my getting involved. Back in the late 50s, jet engines were up for bid on the government auction. You could buy them for three or four and five hundred dollars. And uh, that's when I decided I wanted to put a jet in a car. In October 1964, Art Arfons arrived on the Bonneville Salt Flats behind the wheel of his own jet car, the Green Monster. Built from reconditioned parts and scrap metal, it cost a fraction of Breedlove's Spirit of America. But Arfons and the Green Monster were a formidable force, pushing the unlimited record even higher with a two-way average of 434 miles per hour. The adrenaline was addictive. Once you've got the feel of going fast and accelerating, you can't give it up. I think I'm stuck with it forever. By taking Breedlove's record, Arfons had sparked the most hotly contested duel in land speed history. Well, obviously, he got my attention, and uh, we didn't know what Art's potential was. He certainly had a much more powerful engine than we had. Breedlove returned to Bonneville. The land speed was no longer just about men and their machines, but a battleground for manufacturing giants. 
it was not only the, the competition between the art and myself, but it was competition between Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and Firestone, who were competing to have the fastest tire in the world. And, and so that, that provided the funding to enable us to do that. Without the sponsorship, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been able to, to go for it. Firestone took a big stake in Arfon's car. Goodyear sponsored Breedlove, who was determined to beat Arfon's and win back his land speed crown. He had been the first over 400 miles per hour. Now he wanted to be the first past 500. It's been 35 years since Craig Breedlove almost died at this exact spot at Bonneville. On October 15, 1964, he fired up Spirit of America to retake the world record. Breedlove was about to become the luckiest man alive. By increasing his power setting for the return run, Craig knows that he is within reach of an over 500 mile an hour record. What he doesn't know is that this is going to be the wildest ride of his life. It was the return run of an official record attempt, and he was flying. That car is looking good. Here he comes. Moving fast. He's looking good. He's roaring. He's he cleared the measured mile with a new world record of 526 miles per hour. Then everything went wrong. Something came off of the car. He lost his chute. He lost his chute. Seconds later, Breedlove's emergency parachute also failed. He's going too fast for his brakes to hold. He's out of control. I was coming from the speed course down behind me, and I was still well over 300 miles an hour. Man, he's really moving. And my problem was is that the closer and closer I got to this row of phone poles, the closer and closer they got together. I got to the point where I was thinking, God, I just hope I can get the nose of the car between two of them. He narrowly missed the first set of telephone poles at over 300 miles per hour. There was no way to slow down, and suddenly there was a second set of poles. I knew it was going to be quite a collision. I mean, this is a substantial object. And it just went bang like that, and there was just no phone pole. As Breedlove's team raced to his aid, Spirit of America careened on, plowing through an embankment and pitching into the saltwater pond on the other side. Once I hit this embankment, it shot the nose of the car up into the air, and, and this is at a speed well over 200. The car hit the water and skipped one time, just like a stone. And then the next time it hit, it just grabbed onto it. And of course, the nose went right under. That pole just steered off like nothing. You know, boom, and no ball. And I thought, oh my, another chance. I looked at it. I hit the water, and that water started slowing me down. I seen this big old bank coming. I thought, oh no. I was just almost giddy with joy because I had basically just written my life off. I mean, I, I thought, you know, this this is it. I'm not going to get out of this scrape. Catching the canopy off and trying to get my belt on, I couldn't get my mask off, and the water was filling up like that. I thought, what a way to go. All this and I'm going to drown. <laughs> saw my dad come and saw, you know, guys I'd gone to school with, everything, and uh, it was a pretty high time. We had the record, wrecked the car, but, uh, you know, it was a good day. To break the world record, he had almost paid the ultimate price. Really, you're on your own. There's no one that can help you in any kind of an emergency. It's really up to you and the machine and the circumstance as, as to how you're going to survive.
Just two weeks after Breedlove almost died regaining his crown, Arfons took the record back. Breedlove wasted no time. Only 13 months after the crash, he rolled a brand new Spirit of America out onto the Bonneville Salt Flats. The new car was big on investment and technology. The world held its breath as Breedlove and Arfons dueled on the salt. Over the next two weeks, they drove their machines to greater and greater speeds. The only limit was how far they dare push themselves. Finally, Breedlove became the first official record holder to reach 600 miles per hour. A new page for the record book, and a new entry for the special page that belongs to Craig Breedlove. Then, at the height of the duel, Arfon's luck finally ran out. Arfon's himself had seen it coming. I had a premonition. I, uh, I had seen myself crash, and then it made me a little more apprehensive. But I went out and got in the car when I started the engine. I didn't worry about it at all. Arfons entered the measured mile at breathtaking speed, easily the fastest any car had ever been. But the stress on the car was too much. Seconds after leaving the starting line, disaster struck without warning. Incredibly, Arfons was cut from the wreckage alive. He'd survived a crash at an amazing 610 miles per hour. I never knew it was going over. It, you know, I lost the power wheel and it dug in and did a flip and went 527 feet before it ever hit the ground again. It's a long way to throw a three-ton car. It was the highest speed crash ever survived on land. But as Arfons was stretchered away, his only concern was for his beloved car strewn in pieces across the salt. It's almost like it was a child belonged to me. I uh, really had an attachment to the car. And it sure hurt when I seen it all wadded up in the pile of junk. Uh, it was like losing a child. With the death of the green monster, Art Arfons never again attempted the unlimited land speed record. It marked the close of the greatest battle in the sport's history. But the jet engine was here to stay. It would be another 18 years before a jet car retook the unlimited record. For Richard Noble, the record was as much about national pride as personal ambition. What had happened is, um, really, since uh, Donald Campbell in 1964, um, Britain had just run away from the land speed record. The Americans had now increased the land speed record at, uh, by 50%, and uh, the Brits did a very British thing and tried to pretend it never happened. You know? <laughs> With its side-mounted cockpit and a single jet engine, Noble's Thrust II bore a passing resemblance to Art Arfon's famous Green Monster. But the car's solid aluminum wheels slid all over the salt surface. Noble's record attempts at Bonneville were hopeless. It was at Black Rock Desert in Nevada that his fortune would change. When Noble first set eyes on the dry baked surface, he knew he'd found the perfect ground for his car. On October 4th, 1983, he realized a childhood dream. It's an extraordinary experience, absolutely extraordinary. With your right foot, you slam accelerate right down to max burner, max power, and, um, and then suddenly this huge afterburner lights you, an enormous flame, and you're off. And between naught and uh, 350 miles an hour, the car's all over the place. The 
So you start to come up to um, 650, which is the fastest I ever got to. The extraordinary thing is that your mental processes are, t are turning over very, very fast indeed. So everything is happening in slow motion. go through the measured mile and then the fun starts because then you've got to stop. You see, you're losing speed at about 130 miles an hour per second. And what actually happens is that the inner ear can't cope with this. It's called the somatographic illusion. And you get the impression firmly that the whole world is just doing that and you're driving vertically into the, into the desert. Richard Noble broke the land speed record with a two-way average of 633 miles per hour and took the title record back to Britain for the first time in nearly 20 years. But Noble's next car was to make Thrust 2 seem like a toy. What we wanted to do is to push on and get the supersonic. That was the big one. Um, you know, that's the big, big, that's the Mount Everest, if you like, of land speed record racing. Almost from the first day a jet engine was used in land speed racing, many had wondered if a car could ever break the sound barrier. Most people thought it was impossible. Almost everyone thought it was suicidal. But in August 1995, Richard Noble unveiled a new car. This is Thrust SSC, the supersonic car. Undertaking a project like this is just an enormous, enormous undertaking. I mean, for instance, with the Thrust 2 project, we involved 225 companies. With this one, it was 231. A huge industrial enterprise has got to be put together to, um, to actually support it. Managing such a complex project meant Noble had to vacate the hot seat of the car itself. That was a job that would demand the skills of a specialist. Andy Green is a Royal Air Force Tornado fighter pilot. Breaking the speed of sound is part of his daily routine. When Green was offered the chance to drive a car at over 750 miles per hour, he leaped at the opportunity. It's a chance to do something which every little kid uh, dreams about. Every little boy wants to be a, you know, a, a jet pilot and a space pilot and, uh, and a, uh, a land speed record driver. It is something intrinsically very, very exciting. Controlling a modern jet fighter demands concentration and discipline. Green's Air Force training made him ideally suited for the task ahead. As a fast jet pilot, you're part of a very large team. I fly with a navigator, so myself, my navigator, then the ground crew who service the airplane. That also runs onto the mental side of not actually being frightened of driving the biggest car you've ever sat in, because it's the biggest ever. For me, to be not frightened of that was essential because I had to be comfortable in it, had to operate in it. Richard Noble knew that Green was the man for the job. He got a thousand hours of flying fighters. He was used to controlling this sort of machinery. Mind you, in the air, of course, uh, you've got um, quite a bit more space to it. You sort yourself out when things go wrong. You're not on the ground, you know, with your backside just a, a few inches off the deck. Traveling at the speed of sound generates an enormous shockwave. It was the effect this might have on Thrust SSC that was the team's greatest worry. OK, here we are, flying at about 300, 350 miles an hour, 250 feet above the sea, and we're going to accelerate to supersonic, faster than the speed of sound. That's about 750 miles an hour. The problem with that is, as you approach the speed of sound, at about 700 miles an hour, you get huge pressure waves starting to build up on the front of the aeroplane, which eventually causes the so-called sound barrier and makes the sonic boom created by all sonic vehicles. Now, on an aeroplane, this isn't really a problem because the pressure waves, the shock waves, actually spread out from the aircraft in all directions. 
Of course, with a car, that's very different because the shockwaves underneath the car have nowhere to go. There's a huge pressure buildup under the car. That's the difficult bit about going supersonic on land. Any buildup of pressure between the supersonic car and the ground would be catastrophic. If you get it wrong, the car will take off and it'll go straight up through the clouds. It won't just tumble like a little Formula One car or something. It'll go up through the clouds. It'll be a most awful spectacle. The decision to give thrust SSC twin jet engines was not just to provide extra power. It was to ensure stability and keep it on the ground. With two massive engines, thrust SSC weighed in at 10 tons, the heaviest and biggest land speed car ever built. Basically, yeah, the heavy bit is the engine, so the it's got to be up near the front wheels, so you get your 60% on the front wheels. If that's the case, where do you put the driver? Well, suppose we have two engines. That's good, so we get the weight in the right place, and then we put the driver in the valley between the two engines. That works well. And then we've got to have a nice pointed nose on it to minimize the size of the shock waves. And then before long, the car actually designs itself. By far, the most controversial aspect of the car's design was its steering. Normal front wheel steering was not an option. We could steer the front wheels we put bulges on the side of the car, but if we did that, then that would be an increase in cross-sectional area, and we'd never go supersonic. So this little team of three solemnly decided to build a rear wheel steer car. <laughs> to really sort of double the risk. <laughs> rear wheel steering is more normally found in forklift trucks rather than high performance cars. The first tests in 1996 were carried out in the Al Jaffer Desert in Jordan. But the rear wheel steering was almost impossible to control. had a lot of problems with keeping the vehicle stable. Um, we had created what we believed was the greatest vehicle ever created for the land speed record. It was going to do something no other vehicle had done, but it was very, very hard to control. Now, my fear was letting the team down because my driving abilities weren't enough to control what was basically a directionally unstable car. You know, the definition of an undrivable vehicle is the driver is not good enough to control it. That was always my greatest fear. It had taken four years to get this far. But the fastest the car would go was only 340 miles per hour. As time dragged on, the team's morale and faith in the car reached rock bottom. The team, uh, having built the car, was so thrilled with it that they couldn't conceive a situation where anything would go wrong. From now on, you know, we'd just get it out there and we'd just do it and come home after lunch, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, it wasn't like that. And basically, we were a disaster. We were a team who um, were talking about going supersonic, had somehow created this enormous car and had got 340 miles an hour. You know, we were bad news. By the time unseasonal rain drove them home, Noble's team was dejected and the project almost bankrupt. Ten months later, the Thrust SSC team traveled to Black Rock Desert, Nevada. The only thing that had kept them going after their disastrous trip to Jordan was grim determination. The steering and suspension had been completely modified and rebuilt. By the time it rolled out onto the desert on September 8, 1997, driver Andy Green's faith in the car had been totally restored. Rehearsals were over. For five weeks, FIA timing equipment would officially monitor Thrust SSC's attempt to break the sound barrier. We had built the ultimate research tool. It was 54 feet long, it had 100,000 horsepower, and would then produce from its 100 sensors everything that was happening to it. We were doing a safe approach, and we needed to test all the system and to test the airflow very gradually, gradually building the speed up so that every single time as we got to a speed, we analyzed all the data, we knew we were safe, we could safely add 10 miles an hour onto the speed uh, and still be perfectly comfortable and the airflow wouldn't do anything strange. The team's tactics paid off. Day by day, Green slowly edged thrust SSC ever closer to Mach 1, the speed of sound. Zero, zero, point, six, six, one. Yeah. I read back the mile. Seven, yeah. zero, zero, decimal, six, six, one. 
After three weeks, they captured the official unlimited world record with a two-way average of 714 miles per hour. But dust storms hampered their work, and the sound barrier was still proving elusive. Finally, with just days of the season left, conditions were perfect. At last, as Green tore through the measured mile, the desert echoed to the sound of a sonic boom. Thrust SSC had broken the sound barrier on the first leg of its run. But as Green released his main chute, all hell broke loose. Nothing on chute one, we can shoot two. Two miles to go, 500 miles an hour. Just like it had to Craig Breedlove 33 years before, a faulty chute failed to stop the car. Luckily for Green, Black Rock has more room than Bonneville, and there are no telephone poles to hit. But with the overrun of valuable 15 minutes of the allotted one-hour turnaround were wasted, towing the car back to the course. Green was up against the clock, but on the return run, the car was handling like a dream. As he shot through the measured mile with a speed of 760 miles per hour, a second boom confirmed they had another supersonic run. Their excitement was short-lived. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot do that. You missed it by about a minute. Just 49.6 seconds over the hour, FIA officials disallowed the record. But the run had not been a waste. An aerial photograph had captured this incredible sight. The supersonic shockwave spread out as a line from the nose of the car, highlighted by the sunlit dust. The following morning, spectators turned up in force in the hope that they could witness history being made. The question now was, could Thrust SSC do it all over again? The first run was flawless. Thrust SSC went as straight as an arrow, covering the measured mile in just five seconds. No instability, no chute failure, and another sonic boom. Uh, pit station, the provisional Mach number is, say, 1.015. It's a supersonic run there. The clock is going now. We've been five minutes, 26 seconds since the car entered the measured mile. We've got to be back within the hour. Richard Noble didn't need to worry. It was a textbook turnaround. Leaving the end of the measured mile, I knew that we'd been comfortably supersonic. We've been faster than ever. That was the fastest run ever. Um, very aware of the fact we had just made history, we'd just achieved everything we set out to. But I couldn't even for a second sit back and say, yeah, great, because I'm doing 770 miles an hour, and I've got to slow this car down uh, safely to a halt. And average for the mile, 763.035. And a provisional Mach number on the return run, 1.020. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've just achieved what we set out to achieve all those years ago, eh? That's, um, that's really something. It's the most awe-inspiring, humbling experience you can imagine. Everybody went berserk. The ambulance plane was sort of flying around doing wing overs. <laughs> you know, everybody was just so excited. It was just a fantastic moment, you know. 
this was this was a bit of world history, a tiny little bit of world history, and everybody was celebrating. It was just brilliant. For Andy Green, it was the achievement of a lifetime. We've already done the greatest record, the one that everybody said couldn't be done. We have pioneered that trail. Even if we followed, we would only be tourists in our own footsteps second time round. Breaking the sound barrier on land is an extraordinary record. Until the next generation of jet engine becomes available, the thrust team has pushed technology to the edge. But even the mighty jet may one day be replaced. Technologies of the future are opening up new frontiers for land speed racing. Back in 1898, the very first vehicle to hold the land speed record was an electric car. Over 100 years later, technology has come full circle. Pat Rummerfield is the man at the controls of a car actively pushing the frontiers of technology. And it's no toy. This is White Lightning, a high-performance land speed vehicle for a modern age. Its crew is out on Bonneville, pushing the boundaries, just like the pioneers of the jet cars in the 1960s. This machine runs on what is to become the propulsion system of the 21st century. A few years ago, it would have seemed as unlikely as a car breaking the sound barrier. But White Lightning is an electric car, capable of speeds even greater than Formula One racing cars. Uh, we got over 6,000 batteries here. I don't think anyone's ever wired so many small batteries together at the same time. We could get uh, uh, 300 kilowatts of power. 300 kilowatts is 30,100 watt light bulbs all at the same time. Attempting the electric land speed record once seemed impossible for Pat Rummerfield. But for him, battling the odds is nothing new. Doctors are amazed that he's alive at all. Rummerfield's playful nature belies an incredible story of personal courage and determination. <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri. Rummerfield has become something of a test subject. 25 years ago, a horrific car crash left him fighting for his life. best friend was driving my Corvette and uh, we went up uh, onto the freeway doing about 135 miles an hour. He lost control of the car and we went flying uh, off the freeway. His friend walked away without a scratch, but doctors are stunned that Rummerfield is able to walk at all. On the initial impact, I had a wine bottle stuck between my legs. And as I was hanging on, the, the initial impact slammed my head down between my legs, uh, hitting the wine bottle, popping this eye out of the socket. It just popped it out. From there, I went into the windshield and came back at such velocity that it sheared the seat. When paramedics found him, he had sustained multiple injuries to his shoulder, chest, and neck. The outlook was grim. After arriving at the trauma center, a team of orthopedic and neurosurgeons met with my father and told him basically I had 72 hours to live, that I was just too busted up for them to do anything with. Rummerfield had damaged his spinal cord and was paralyzed from the neck down, but he refused to give in, defying the odds his 72-hour life expectancy stretched first to three weeks, then three months. I asked them to put a, uh, my, the x-ray of my neck, of my cervical, up over my bed. And I'd lay there and I'd look at that x-ray and I'd, I'd say, Every, everything's going to be okay, don't panic. 
I was laying there daydreaming about racing cars and playing basketball when all of a sudden my left big toe moved. And it was just like that. There was unbelievable pain. It felt like I was being electrocuted. Immediately after that came the, the hot pokers. It felt like I was being burnt everywhere. It was just like my body was on fire. With an internal flick of a switch, Rummerfield's brain had found a way to reroute electrical impulses throughout his entire nervous system. We don't know exactly what it is about Pat that allowed him to recover to such a great extent. If you compare his MRI to other individuals that appear to have the same degree of injury in the spinal cord, yet they're stuck in a wheelchair. It took him almost two years to walk you know, well over, you know, seven years to even partially run. If he doesn't exercise every single day, that greatly reduces his ability to even walk. So you can imagine how hard Pat needs to work to break the land speed record. Pat Rummerfield wages a constant battle against paralysis. To him, attempting a land speed record will prove a point. I run in marathons. I haven't won one. I mean, I usually come in last. But when it comes to setting land speed records, where you put a, a person with a disability on an even keel with able-bodied people, I wear these so I can't hear myself scream. I think my past successes have proven that we are just as capable as any able-bodied person if given the chance. As Rummerfield climbs into his cramped cockpit, the atmosphere is tense. He knows that without three years of hard work by his team, he wouldn't be here. Spending time away from his strict exercise regime is taking its toll. Because of his spinal injuries, Rummerfield's body feels the effects of fatigue more than most. For him, an attempt at the record cannot start soon enough. You won't have any problem with it, I don't think. But it's rough down by the five on the left side. It's a little bumpy. It's, it's starting to get bumpy. With uh, my background, the first couple times that I drove the White Lightning back in the, uh, the early years, I'm, I'm pretty sure the first couple runs, I probably held my breath the whole way. At last, officials give Rummerfield clearance to attempt the first leg of the two-way run required for an electric world record. White Lightning is unlike any other land speed car. Its engine produces no characteristic roar, just the whine of a single battery-powered motor. From the outside, the car is almost stealth-like. It's so silent, it, it just looks like, almost like a mirage as it's floating down and it's just hovering right, right above the salt. But inside the car, it's a different story. The salt, as you're going over 200 miles an hour, sounds just like someone's underneath the car with a sandblaster. Any uh, shock or any bumps is uh, translated right up to my spine, to my brain. Not an ideal situation for a person with spinal injuries. Your brain has to work three to four times harder to translate the uh, images coming through. You're so fiercely concentrating on peering out that window, searching for the mile markers, and you don't take your foot off the accelerator unless you absolutely have to. It's a very fast run, but the car is so quiet that the support team has trouble picking it out as it glides across the salt. That's him, I'm telling you. I can see the yellow chute. I can see the, that's the car, it's him. It's coming. Okay. 
You guys got a yellow shoot, right? Yellow and black shoot. As Rummerfield pulls in, the crew gets word of his speed through the first run. You hear the number? No. Oh. 248. Wow. Good shape. Good. The existing record stands at 215 miles per hour. With a speed of 248, Rummerfield is on course for a new record. The challenge now is to get the car repowered in time for a return run. If the car doesn't make the second run back through the mile within one hour, they'll miss the record. Exhausted, Pat Rummerfield remains inside White Lightning as the crew replaces 20 racks of batteries and runs systems checks. Forty-five minutes later, comfortably ahead of schedule, both car and driver are primed for their return run. We're going to send the electric car. As the car heads back down the course, Rummerfield is just moments away from the history books. Godspeed, Mr. Rummerfield knows he's fast, but the official time will be the one handed down by the FIA timing station. As he opens his canopy, word from the timing officials comes through. They've done it. 245.524, average over the mile. Congratulations, you did it, guys. Hey, hey, hey. Congratulations. Hey. I feel like God truly really blessed me. I've, I've gotten a second chance, and this run was right on the edge. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's mystery, and today's blessing. <laughs> Pat Rummerfield epitomizes the spirit of those who pursue the land speed record. He has proved that electric cars are the future. One day, they may even eclipse the jet cars. The land speed record is the ultimate race, a race that has lasted for over a hundred years. One day, Andy Green's supersonic record will be broken. Whoever tries it is going to find it very, very difficult to go faster than we did. What I hope is that they succeed, and they succeed sometime soon. For someone who cheated death in the pursuit of the world record, Art Arfons knows how much courage that will take. Well, I think he's going to sit there for a while. A long while. <laughs> The only limit Craig Breedlove foresees is that of the human spirit. As long as someone is willing to build the car and go forward, and they can find the funding to do it, the land speed record is something that'll just perpetuate. There's only one thing that, that can guarantee our failure. That's if we quit. For those in the pursuit of land speed, human nature will never let that happen.